Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, you are a great and mighty God. You are loving in all your ways. Lord, we are eager this morning to hear from your word. We pray that your word today falls on good soil. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, please turn in your Bible to the Old Testament book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 4. You'll find Hosea right after the book of Daniel, chapter 4. I am running the risk this morning. Now, this is my thinking, not Pastor John's. I am running the risk of stealing his thunder. That's because he'll be preaching through Hosea as part of his series on the minor prophets. Nevertheless, he encouraged me to go ahead with what I had planned. I guess the benefit is, whatever I mess up today, he can fix. So we're just dro- since we're dropping into this book, let me give you just uh, very briefly a bit of the backstory. The year is around 750 B.C. And the northern kingdom of Israel, which had kept the name Israel, wasn't doing very well. For one thing, there was a great deal of political instability. They had had six different kings in a 25-year period. In addition to that, there was a growing threat from the east that would be the Assyrians who were known for their cruelty and violence. Most significant, however, and this is the important backstory to the book of Hosea, Most significant, however, is that the nation of Israel was in a state of very steep moral and spiritual decline. Hence the sending of a prophet. Now what would God say through his prophet? Well, look with me at verse 12. Hosea chapter 4, verse 12. The Lord is speaking through Hosea. The Lord says, my people inquire of a piece of wood and their walking staff gives them oracles. For a spirit of whoredom has led them astray and they have left their God to play the whore. Now I regard this verse as a summary statement of the nation's spiritual condition. There existed in the nation of Israel at the time of Hosea a spirit of whoredom. Or other translations use the word prostitution. There was a spirit of prostitution. Whether whoredom or prostitution, that is a metaphor for a nation that no longer worshipped God, but instead had aligned themselves with idols. Now concerning God, to whom the people had once pledged their devotion and faithfulness, go back to chapter 2. Go back to chapter 2, verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 13. The Lord continues, And I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals, when she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry and went after her lovers and notice this and forgot me, declares the Lord. So what of the Lord? It's not that they thought badly of him. They just didn't think of him at all. The Lord was of no consequence to their lives not worthy of their thoughts, good or bad. This reminds me of the quote, the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. The opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. 
As an aside, I can't help but wonder if this is where we are at as a nation. We've become indifferent toward God. Now the verse we just read, verse 13, sends a strong signal as to what the nation of Israel should expect. I will punish her, the Lord says. In other words, this is how it will play out. And Hosea's task was to make it clear, this is how it will play out. After all, this was, this, these were the terms of the covenant, that they would be punished if they do not follow the terms and conditions. Only dropped into the middle of this is a stunning revelation. Revelation. Go to chapter 11. This is the last passage I'll have you turn to. Chapter 11. Beginning with verse 1. I want you to note the sorrow in the Lord's voice. Chapter 11, verse 1. The Lord says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. I'll insert the word however. However, the more they were called, the more they went away. So this is a restatement of Israel's unfaithfulness. Now comes the judgment, right? It's all set up. The case has been made. The indictments have been rendered. The hammer is going to fall. Only look at verse 8. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? That's another name for Israel. How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? Adma and Zeboim were two cities that were destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord asked, how can I do this? How can I punish you? I know the covenant stipulates that I will, but I can't. Why can't he? Why can't he? Here's the reason, verse, the end of verse 8. My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. A better translation would be, my compassion is aroused. My heart has been ignited. My heart has been stirred up. As a result, verse 9, I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Wow. Wow. What we have here is one of the clearest revelations in all of Scripture of the heart of God for his people. Let me say that again. What we have here is one of the clearest revelations in all of Scripture of the heart of God for his people, and what we see is that it is a warm and tender heart, a kind heart, a patient heart, a compassionate heart. And what is it that stirs up his heart? Is it, is it their good behavior? Is it their faithfulness? No, it is their unfaithfulness. It is their betrayal of him. This is what ignites God's heart. Amazing. As I reflected on this, I thought back to my daughter's senior year of high school and the junior-senior prom. One afternoon, she went out shopping with her mom to find a dress. She found the perfect dress. Only Sally said it was too expensive. Now, it sounds like I'm throwing Sally under the bus. But A, she was handling our finances and money was tight. And B, the dress really was overpriced. No, I had no clue about that, but that's what I was told. 
Well, not surprisingly, our daughter was disappointed. So being a clever teenager, she came to me. (laughs) She said, Dad, I found the perfect dress. It only costs X number of dollars. I don't remember what it was. Can I get it? Now remember, I had no idea what a dress should cost, nor was I smart enough to ask what her mother thought. All I could see is that she was really excited, so I said, get the dress, get the dress. Well, as she danced around the room, I soon found out that she had left out some information that was quite relevant, (laughs) namely what her mother had said. Under those circumstances, I believe I had the right, maybe even an obligation, to reverse my decision, but I could not do it. To be honest, I didn't even seriously consider it. I wanted her to have that dress. What Sally wanted, of course, was an explanation. So very awkwardly, I spoke from my heart, of my heart. And you men in the room who have daughters, you'll understand what I'm about to say. Daughters have a special place and special status in their father's heart. When it comes to our daughters, our hearts are kind of squishy. To use biblical language, our hearts are warm and tender. Our hearts are a storehouse of benevolence and generosity just for them. No matter how old our daughter, she remains our little girl. Frankly, this special place that a daughter has in their father's heart, if known by the daughter, and I think most daughters know it at a young age, this knowledge can be exploited. And you know what? We fathers, we hardly notice. And we don't much care. And this is what I explained or tried to explain that afternoon 20 years ago. In a similar way, what God is explaining in Hosea chapter 11 is the special place that the nation of Israel had in his heart. Elsewhere in the Bible, Israel is described as the apple of God's eye, or as a human father would say, my little girl. What this means is that when it came to Israel, God's heart was kind of squishy. It was a heart of tenderness and compassion, a storehouse of generosity and benevolence just for them. And because of this, he wasn't going to do what he probably should do and undoubtedly would do with any other nation. How can I give you up? This was the heart of God for his people. So what does this mean for us? Whenever I have the opportunity to train teachers, I tell them, and this didn't originate with me, but you need to answer three questions about the passage. What, so what, and now what? We've considered the what of this passage. God's heart for his people. Now we move to the so what. How is this passage relevant to us? Well, who are God's people today? Who is the apple of God's eye today? Answer, we are. All the redeemed in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, this is made explicit in a passage like 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 where the Apostle Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, you, referring to the church, you are a chosen people, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. We are God's people. What this means then is that when it comes to us, and if you're a believer in Christ, when it comes to you, God's heart, yes, I will say it, when it comes to you, God's heart is kind of squishy. And the remarkable thing is, is that he wants you to know this. Is it possible for us to exploit this knowledge? I suppose it is in some way. If for some reason you wanted to do that. And I suppose some Christians do. But to God it is worth the risk. It is important to him that you know how he feels about you. Even if you figure out some way to exploit it. So why is this? Why is it important to God that you know how he feels about you? I can think of two reasons. The first one is is pretty obvious. Number one, God wants you to know him. God wants you to know him. And not just know about him. He wants you to really know him. At a a deep and personal and intimate way. And this requires self-disclosure of the heart. Now we understand this. This is true of any relationship. For any relationship to thrive and be at its best, each party in the relationship needs to know the heart of the other. If one or the other person in a relationship uh, hides their heart or conceals their heart, then that relationship is diminished. Obviously, God knows your heart. He's omniscient. He, He knows everything. He knows your heart better than you know your heart. But you don't know his heart until he tells you. And here he does. And what he's saying here, in effect, is I'm crazy about you. I really am. Maybe you're a teenager. Got some teenagers down here. You're struggling with acceptance with your peers. God's crazy about you. He really is. Maybe you're a divorcee. You're dealing with rejection and abandonment. God is crazy about you. He really is. Maybe you're a parent who has these strong feelings of failure and not being the parent you should be. God is crazy about you. He really is. Now let's back up a bit and ponder something for a moment. Ponder with me the notion that at one level, the ridiculous notion that the God of the universe, now think of this now, the God of the universe wants any kind of relationship with us, much less a close one. That's like, that's like one of us wanting a close personal relationship with a mosquito. Now, I realize all analogies break down at a certain point, and this one certainly does, but you get the point. Who are we, who are we that God would desire a relationship with us? And yet he does. And yet he does. So one reason that God reveals his heart for us, to us, is for the furtherance of that relationship. He wants us to know how he feels about us. Do you know him? Do you know him? You know him through his son. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the exact representation of God. So learn of Christ. Learn of Christ. 
and you will know God. And you will know God. There's a second reason that God tells us how he feels about us. This one is perhaps less obvious. And that is God wants any disruption in his relationship with you caused by sin to be quickly resolved. That's longer, so let me repeat it. God wants any disruption in his relationship with you caused by sin to be quickly resolved. Now, in explain that, let me start with what it probably is obvious. After conversion, after baptism, after church membership, we continue to sin. And sin separates us from God. Not positionally, but experientially. In other words, when we sin as believers, we don't lose our position with God. He doesn't unadopt us. He doesn't boot us out of the family. But nor do we experience the same closeness with God when we've sinned. Instead, there is what I call a a cooling of the relationship until we go to him in repentance. Now here's where I'd ask you to listen very carefully. In order to encourage us to go to God in repentance, thus restoring the relationship, God has revealed his heart. The main feature being, when we fail in our relationship with God, his heart toward us, his heart for us doesn't shrink, doesn't turn away. On the contrary, his heart for us expands. It it grows warmer and more tender. This is the message of Hosea chapter 11. As I said, a better translation of verse 8 of that chapter is that his heart is stirred up. His passion is ignited. In the case of Israel, what did that? Their sin did that. Their idolatry did that. And knowing this, that this is God's heart for us when we've been unfaithful, should propel us to go to him, not away from him, out of fear or guilt or shame. A book that's had a big influence on my life, especially my years as a pastor, is a little book entitled The Hidden Rift with God. The Hidden Rift with God by William Backus. For over 30 years, Backus was both a pastor and a professional counselor. And over the course of his career, he became convinced that most Christians, now we're talking Christians now, most Christians he maintained have a hidden rift with God. Meaning, there is something in their relationship with God, something in their history with God, that causes them to keep God at arm's length and to avoid with him true intimacy and deep relationship. Yes, we go to church, we read the Bible, we pray, we serve, we give, but deep down, Bacchus maintained, deep down, there is something causing us to keep God at arm's length. Now, according to Bacchus, the reasons for this are varied. But one common reason is many Christians have a misguided understanding of God's heart. Insofar as many of us assume that God's heart is like the typical human heart. What is the typical human heart? The typical human heart is one that shrinks, that closes up, 
when the other party in a relationship is unpleasant, disagreeable, or unlovely. Is that not true? Unfortunately. But I'm here to tell you today, not with God. Not his heart. My main encouragement to you today is that when you have been unpleasant toward God, when you've been disagreeable, when you've been unlovely, when you've been unfaithful, when you've been disobedient, when you've forgotten God, his heart for you swells. His desire intensifies. His passion and compassion is stirred up for you. This is the heart of God for you. Amazing. One thing I've tried to teach my daughter is to get an oil change every 5,000 miles. And this, I surprised you with that, didn't I? This past fall, she did so. Completely on her own. I was so proud of her. Although she informed me that the mechanic told her she needed a new battery and new tires. I said, well, why don't you just get that taken care of right away? Well, she had another place she had to get to, and besides new battery, new tires, that would seem to be a dad thing. So I said, okay. This was last fall. Fast forward to December. She was going on a, a trip with her cousin to Florida. I said, okay, Mandy, uh, you need to get to the airport early. Just drive over to our house. I'll take you to the airport. I'll drop you at the door. And then when you're on your trip, I'll get your car fixed. Well, she had already made arrangements with her cousin to get to ride to the air, airport with her. So I said, okay. Fast forward again to Monday, January 15, and you may, may remember that day, minus 11 degrees. I was working out at the landing, exercising. My phone buzzes, it's her. Dad, my car won't start. Can you come and give me a jump? Oh. I said I'll be there in 30 minutes. The point of this story is not, is not that I'm such a great dad. I'm a very flawed dad. Rather, the point of the story is that despite her having messed up, despite her having ignored my repeated warnings, she still came to me when she needed help. The reason I suspect is because she knows who she is to me. She knows even at the age of 37, that she is my little girl. And I want to ask you this morning, do you know who you are to God? Do you know who you are to God? Do you know his heart for you? Personalizing Jeremiah 31, God's heart yearns for you. You are the child in whom he delights. He is not chronically disappointed with you. When you lay your head on the pillow at night, night after night, he's not shaking his head in disappointment. He delights in you. So go to him. Go to him when you've messed up when you've fallen, when you've rebelled, when you've wandered away. He loves you. He loves you. 
Indeed, he's crazy about you. Let's pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for revealing your heart for us, to us. And Lord, we can get so We can find ourselves in such a a wrong place because we assume your heart is like the typical human heart. One that shrinks and pulls back and grows cold when the relationship doesn't go as, as it could or should. But on the contrary, when We fall short in our relationship with you. Your heart for us expands. Your passion for us ignites. And so, Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in this room who is distant from you today, who has been holding back, keeping you at arm's length, may they have a clear understanding of your heart for them. Your passion for them has been ignited, has been aroused. And may they come running back to you and enjoy the intimacy with you that you desire. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.